are an intimate group today, so this is privacy, uh, state of play. Um, so thank you for coming. You guys are going to be the most informed of all of these companies out here who really need to talk about what we're going to talk about today. So the assignment was actually security, state of play. And let's talk about the greatest uh, risks that security has to offer. So I've changed it up a little bit, and we're going to look at security through a slightly different angle. I'll give you a little background on myself. I started out as a patent litigator, and my undergraduate is actually in psychology rather than high tech. I got into privacy because as a young researcher, I was applying robotic technology, teaching young students who are paraplegic or quadriplegic how to do science projects. Now, in the 80s, when this was all going on, when things were still in BASIC and Python, um, and Python in, in uh, early, early language, not Python, and an, uh, on an Apple IIe Plus, the interface was quite crude, and it was really easy to introduce bugs into the code. So the security was quite weak. So what we did is we were teaching these, these small kids how to do science, and I was very excited about it. I was an 18-year-old kid and came bounding in and said, where is the $10,000 uh, uh, Apple machine and, and Rico robotic arm. Tell me where the research facilities are. And this woman at the grade school kind of looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, the, the special needs students, where are they? And she said, oh, the vegetables. We teach the vegetables in the back of the school. The reason I tell you that story, and I'll tell you the rest, is that I think that we are looking at users, we're looking at employees, we're looking at the internet of everything and clouds as if they were our vegetables, as if they are inanimate objects that don't really have any right to be heard, right to be interacted with, right to be developed and engineered to for value. When I went into the research program, one of the things that we learned is that our code had a defect. And so if you hit the machine 17 keystrokes in a row, and these are young children of varying abilities, you would get the Rico arm to reset. Now, if you've ever seen a robotic arm in a car factory, it's kind of a simple thing, and it kind of does this. So when a young child puts a beaker of liquid and then quickly hits 17 codes in a row, it causes the thing to reset if there's a bug. And it doesn't just put your beaker down gently. It goes like this. And the amazing thing about that experience was that our users, formerly known as vegetables, by me, known as my students, and by their, by their names, they would look at me and they would laugh. They use technology to learn science, to empower themselves, to communicate with their family members using the technology we had in the early 1980s. So today, we're talking about all these applications, all this great innovation here at Collision, and we forget that our users are not vegetables, that our users have a lot to say about what it is that we're building. And so this is really the security state of play. So now, fast forward many, many decades later, I'm the chief privacy officer for Intel Security. I'm looking at building security in, building privacy in from the chip layer all the way out to the carbon-based unit, you and me. All the mobile devices that we're talking about, mobile apps. You hear the word whispered, Security, privacy, but how do we actually get this done? And that's really what I want to talk to you about. And, and because we only have 20 minutes, I'm really going to talk to you about how you get started in a very pragmatic way. So this is the topics for today, really, is, is it really the security state of play? Are we talking about crypto? Are we talking about um, threat intelligence? Are we talking about even firewalls? All great things. I sell them to you every day. Or are we really talking about why data matters. To whom does it connect us? To what do we want to know more about? And how do we lead our organizations in a different way to really engineer in data privacy? So the question is, and you'll see that these are all questions, none of these are answered yet, which is a really exciting thing. Because as you can see by who's filling this room here, not that many people have many answers. There's a lot of people out there wandering around who have very religious opinions. Maybe there's no privacy at all. We certainly can use Facebook. We had that same conversation when we invented the telephone. 
Maybe there's no privacy. You know, the first time they had this debate in writing was after the Gutenberg Press was invented. We have no privacy because now people can go off and read books separately and alone from other people and come up with ideas that they didn't learn in church. They literally, there are texts about how they talked about privacy invasions based on the Gutenberg Press. I will submit to you that perhaps it is security that is dead and we need to change our model and modalities of doing security and it is privacy, which I will define in a minute in a functional way, that can be preserved and innovated and create tremendous value on a couple different vectors. So I'll give you a quick kind of walk through memory lane on where we started with our security technologies and how the functionality of data actually fits into this paradigm. So in the first stage of the information age was really the firewall. So when we had punch cards, when we had time sharing, when we had one person with one control, it was really quite easy. So a fact that you won't know about me is that I actually was the world's first chief security officer. Now my title at the time was actually part-time temporary assistant secretary at ExxonMobil. And my job was the only possessor of the physical key that would unlock a broom closet that held our Wang computer. How many people remember a Wang? Like one dude. <laughs> that was state of the art, baby. And it didn't do very much, and it wasn't connected to an internet that didn't exist yet. So I never got hacked. It all stayed in, inside of the organization, and nothing ever happened. So very small functionality means very small threat detection and vector requirements. Isn't that great? As you walk up the functionality scale, as you walk up the communication scale, the primacy of your security requirements grows, and your privacy complexity, your human element grows accordingly. We got to the internet stage. At this point in my young career, I was a paralegal, so my job was schlepping giant boxes of paper from uptown Manhattan down to the courthouse, and I would get a little receipt. That transaction was controlled by the weight of the paper, the expense of the cab ride, the fact that I had an attorney monitoring my duties, the fact of this little pink slip that I got from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York City. All of those credentialings, all of those authentications that happened along the paper trail helped to ensure that the fiduciary responsibility around that data was indeed created in a system where a technology hadn't caught up to speed. There was never an attorney or a judge or a litigant that said, we have no attorney-client privilege, we have no litigation, we have no justice system, because the technology can't tr transmit our documents in HTTPS. We created a system and a chain of command and a chain of custody for data, and we allowed the technology to catch up to the business processes that we'd invented. The extranet was when we all had lifting and shutting our various doors in our systems. We had a firewall and you'd have to open and close them. This is when we started to see the holes really start to go. This is where the Kevin Mitnicks of the world started compromising our modems. Our security became technical at this, pay, at this stage. Our security became secret. It became something that like five guys in black t-shirts and ponytails and Birkenstocks did. Not all of you collective engineers and entrepreneurs and business people and reporters were really talking about or dealing with. It's a shame because at this stage, we really took our security and our privacy functionality to a new low, even as the technology footprint went escalating higher and higher. Access is about where we are today. We think that we're in Web 2.0. We're not even quite there yet, and we're already talking about Web 3.0 with the singularity and, and artificial intelligence, but we're still really trying to sort out what is ID management. So our goal and everything that we're talking about in Collision, I think, has to do with really intelligence, converting data into something of, that's knowledge and wisdom and actionable. So I wanted to kind of take some time and unwind these different stages because I'm hoping you'll start to get the theme that the future of privacy and security is very much grounded and where we've already been, in the recognition of doing what we know that has worked in the past is actually the foundation so that we can start to look at what are the human use cases that we want to address, 
how do we build the requirements and specifications into complex and increasingly shared and open systems in a matter that actually functionalizes our humanity rather than throwing up our hands in despair and saying there's no privacy because we have Snapchat. So I'll posit to you that security and privacy are not the same thing. One is possible but hard, and the other is inherently impossible. So I will posit to you that security is possible on paper, but hard. And you never quite get to a secure state. It will always be a game of cat and mouse, of compromise and catch up, of new exploit and dumb human doing dumb human tricks. Privacy, on the other hand, you have heard over and over again over the years is dead. Well, if it is dead, then it's the sexiest looking zombie I've ever seen. It keeps rising back again and again. I talk to people all the time. I never walk into an audience and see everyone dressed exactly the same. We crave individuality. We desire to stand out and stand apart. Even when I talk to graduating classes of cadets who are literally beaten into similarity so that they match for their military purposes, so that they're singularly thinking as one unit, those soldiers all differentiate themselves in one way or another. Privacy is functionally the authorized processing of personally identifiable information according to fair business processing. Now, I won't unwind everything in 20 minutes, but each of those elements is a functional specification. Each one of those elements is an invitation to come up with a more delightful interface with greater and greater functionality that actually interoperates in our increasingly mobile world. So when we talk about authorization, the who, why, where, what, and how, that is not a euphemism for password challenge. It's a challenge for the artists who should come up with something beautiful. It's a challenge for the person who comes up with a mobile device or some sort of tool so that when I go in to check on my prescriptions for my healthcare, maybe I get a little scent of alcohol so that my mind in my limbic system is now reminded that I'm now doing something that is intensely private, that has to be serious, that needs to be accurate, and maybe I get a whiff of like, I don't know, vomit and cigarettes, the Vegas smell, if I'm just like going on an app to get an Eventbrite ticket to go to a party. Somebody much more creative than your legal team is going to come up with that one. But I will posit to you that it's much more than a challenge of password, and it's much more than an invitation to secure, lock down, keep confidential the data. It's about sharing. The news story here is that intellectual property will be driven by the people that own it, steal it, share it, and create it. When you use people in that sentence, you are talking about data privacy and the collection and protection of the human supply chain that creates value. So authorized processing. Data sitting back in a data center doing nothing is being processed. I have heard a million times that storage is so cheap. We save data with abandon because storage is cheap. If you sit in my chair and you look across my organization and you read the laws coming out of Europe that say 5% of worldwide turnover is the greatest penalty for a data breach, suddenly those teraflops of data are not so cheap. It's kind of like saying I got a sale on two by fours and therefore everyone living in my house is worthless. So stop looking at the technology as a proxy for value and I think you'll start to open your eyes to the possibility of creating a better way of processing data through its life cycle in a curated type of a fashion. And then finally, the fair information principles. There are whole books written on this, but we've got these concepts that go way back, global concepts. One of the few things we can agree on as humans, tell us what you're doing before you do it. Don't surprise me. Tell me if we're gonna send your information into a place that doesn't respect it in the same way, or come up with a mechanism that will. These are very basic precepts, and they actually underlie 90% of the world's legal requirements. The compliance mantra 
is something for the legal team. Your mantra as entrepreneurs and innovators is to delight that customer. Think about what fairness means to you. And think about how broadly your customers are today. Talk to diverse customers and figure out that cultural differences when you're coding actually matter. Having something that's entirely based on what a middle-aged soccer mom who is white, raised in the Midwest, and has 2.5 children, at least I hope there's only two, let's, let's not go to the 0.5. If you are tuning it only to me, then you are breaking your system before it even starts. So start with what fairness looks like to you, and I will tell you my four-part test for every company I've ever set up a privacy program or protocol for. The four-part test goes like this. Test number one, is it moral? There was once a company that was going to make $200 million in a single transaction, sticking RFID tags underneath prisoners' skin and coding to say how horrible these human beings are. And it would have brought a lot of money into the company, and the sales guys were very charmingly excited about it. And I really took a lot of time and thought about it, and I came up with a lot of different kinds of solutions, you know, putting the chip in, in the uniforms or putting it on a band that they had to wear or figuring out the thing. And at the end of the day, I actually ended up going to our CEO and saying, I can't morally get around this. I don't care that it's legal in this jurisdiction. This is just something, this is not what we do. And to his grand, grand credit, the CEO in that case said no. I think we all have the opportunity to say yes and get away with it and then tell each other, well, it was legal. It was compliant. No, you start with morality. Sometimes you'll get it right, sometimes you'll get it wrong. Second stage is legal. Is it legal and is it legal in all the jurisdictions where you're going? It's a tougher question to answer, but if you're looking at that fair information process, uh, processing kind of deck, then you're going to hit that mark pretty um, high on the risk factor. So you're going to do pretty well in that thing. The next one is ethical. And I'm separating morality and ethics in this way. I think that ethics in a corporate setting in particular or a governmental setting really equates to brand. Is this, little, in, this activity in line with our brands? One minute? Oh, man. OK, I totally went way, way, way too long. All right, so I'm going to get to the final punchline here, which is I do think that this is inherently possible. Once you get to the final um, stage, is, is it commercially relevant? It is not terrible to talk about the commercial relevance of data in context of an NGO, of government, of a corporation. You are not discarding the human right because inherently built into that deck is a conversation about how information that you process and all the collection of vendors and supply chains you have around your information environment have the four elements of morality, legality, ethics, and commercial sustainability. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. Um, lots more to say on this topic, but I'm glad you guys are here. Thank you.